This is our machine trainer that we use to simulate real world brakes. And we added this pneumatic addition to it so that we could talk through troubleshooting it as well. And what I found with a lot of the technicians that come here is they would look at it when it's broken and be like, okay, can you explain this? I know somehow that thing moves, but I don't get how all this stuff does. So I thought I would do an overview of pneumatics from a control technician's perspective. This video will not get you to the point that you can design a pneumatic system. In fact, I need to thank Mark Arnold with SMC with helping me with the part numbers for this setup. This is your basic air compressor. Now typically it's not gonna be on your machine. In our training center, we need to keep it all compacted down so we can just plug it into 110 volts so it mounts underneath. But usually this would be a plant air compressor. This is our pump and it's gonna pump air into the tank and we can read our pressure here. It has a mechanical pressure switch to turn on and off the pump and it will be distributed through the plant from there. And many times you'll see these quick connects at the machines. Slide them back to release, release, connect. After that, it should go through a dryer. In fact, I probably should add a dryer to this just to help you understand the full system when you come to my class. But as we pull outside air into this tank and compress it, we're also pulling the moisture out of the air and that moisture will fall out. And an often overlooked item is this drain valve on the bottom. This is not simply to drain the air if you shut the compressor off. This is actually the bottom of the tank where the water is going to collect. Every so often you should open this up. And typically you're going to see an automatic drain on these. Now I don't have an automatic drain on this one because I don't really have anywhere to drain it on this carpet. So I do just take a cup occasionally and drain it out. Then it comes up to our shutoff valve. And this shutoff valve is not simply a ball valve. And I see a lot of machines out there that just have a lockable ball valve on them. That is not considered a safe way to lock out a pneumatic system because you are cutting it off and storing that pressure on the system. We need to relieve that pressure. Right now, we currently have about 80 PSI. We switch it off. And you probably heard it dumped the air out the bottom. And now we're showing zero PSI here. And then I have a spot to lock out my pneumatics. And this is something our industry is getting better about. But so many of us think that lock out tag out means we simply lock out the electrical system. But we need to remove all energy. And that includes pneumatics. This is our mechanical regulator where we can adjust our pressure. It also has a filter down here. And I bet you if I ask you, when's the last time you changed the filter on any of your pneumatics? I bet you say never. But this is key to the operation of your system because all that trash that could be in our pneumatic lines is gonna end up in this cylinder. And as it moves back and forth, that grit is gonna end up on this shaft. And that's what's gonna wear our seals out and make us start leaking and eventually wear our bearings out and then we're gonna start having poor performance in the machine. After that, we have the mist separator coalescent filter. And you'll see this on applications that have more sensitive pneumatic equipment, such as our IO link regulator. Also notice both the filter regulator and the mist separator have drains on them as well. After that, we have a second regulator. We actually have an electronic regulator and this one's over IO link. But using an electronic regulator, we can adjust the pressure depending on whether the machine has a demand for air. Because unfortunately, as pneumatics wear, they will start to leak some. And if we could drop that pressure down, they'll leak less. And air leaks are a big preventable expense that most plants ignore. Then we're gonna come to our solenoid bank. And this is hardly a comprehensive video talking about the various different types of solenoids that are out there. But there are two main ones that I think as we'll say a controls technician you should know about. And that is the double actin solenoid and the single actin solenoid. And so the double has a coil on both sides. The single just has a single coil. The single actin solenoid has two positions and for which is we extend the cylinder, retract the cylinder. The double actin solenoid has three positions because the spool can be energized one direction, the spool can be energized the other direction, or it can be in the center. And that center position could be closed, it could be open, or it could be pressurized. And if you'd like to learn about some symbols, then let me know down in the comments. Maybe I'll do a video on that. Early on in my career, because yeah, it seems like all of us early on in our career, we just only think about, well, I gotta be the cheapest person possible. The sooner you can get out of that thinking, the better off you're gonna be with your career. 
But if your cylinder only needs to fully extend or fully retract, then shouldn't we always use a single actin solenoid? And I have the second one on here, just so we could talk about what happens when either the power fails or when we have an e-stop condition. Now there are safety valves to put on the inlet of your control systems. I don't have one, but if you'd like to see a video on that, put it down in the comments. Maybe I can work something out. But let's talk about the difference and how these two will work. Right now I'm connected to the double actin solenoid. And so first I can actually jog this cylinder and it can stop mid stroke. Now I'll switch to the single acting solenoid and I'm retracted right now. And when I energize the solenoid, it fully extends. And when I de-energize the solenoid, it fully retracts. So first issue with this is we're always applying air pressure to our air lines and our cylinder. And those are gonna be the leak points. I'm not saying that we wouldn't be leaking on our solenoid bank, but chances are your leaks will be out on the machine where the cylinder's doing the action and where lines are getting scuffed. So we can turn off this double actin solenoid once it's in position and reduce our leakage. The other thing, and this I see is a terrible safety issue on a lot of your systems is what happens to your pneumatics when you press the e-stop? Again, we don't have a safety dump valve on this one to dump our air on an e-stop, but most of you don't either. So let's go back to our double actin solenoid. I'm gonna extend it out, and then I'm gonna press the e-stop, and it stays where it's at. Now let's switch to the single acting, which is retracted when it's powered off. I'm gonna extend it out, and when I press the e-stop, it closes which means we can have a lot of unnecessary movement. On these cylinders, these little knobs, these are flow controls. And I see a lot of you when you're new leaving these off the machines. And notice when we extend this and retract it, how smooth the action is. And the less we're hammering our system, the longer the life's gonna be. One final piece of this is the reed switches. And this piston in here has a magnetic ring on it. And these are magnetic proxies. I'm really not sure why we call them reed switches and pneumatics, but if I take a magnet and I stick it on the side of it, then the switch lights up. And that is because it's sensing that magnetic field. Now, one thing that really set off this system and sets off a lot of well-designed pneumatic systems is these distribution blocks. And here's a link with some great tips about connectorizing your systems.